Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another PropTech Ramble in Series 3. Uh, today, I'm joined by the co-founder and chief strategist of Purposeful Intent, uh, Corinne Murray. Corinne, thank you very much for, for joining. Would Thanks you be so able to having. introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about who you are? And I've got a couple of questions already about the name and how did you start? Because you literally, we were talking just before we came live, you were you started on Monday, but that's obviously not the whole story, right? <laughs> yes. So could you introduce yourself and just give us a bit of background and how you got to where you are and why you've started Purposeful Intent? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Corinne Murray. I am, as uh, as was said, I am chief strategist and co-founder of Purposeful Intent, which uh, went live officially this Monday. So this is, uh, it was April 4th, I believe. Um we created this, a friend, a friend and I, through the industry with a number of other uh, partners and collaborators, we really saw a gap in the industry uh, about how companies are to address the future of their workplace and, and the future of their work, work and culture, um, really just making sure that there's a forward thinking and human centered approach to the future rather than how does a company design for itself. And that's where there's a big I, well, let me start over. That <laughs> that was very wordy and not saying a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the reason purposeful and the reason we created purposeful intent is because a lot of the the ways that the real estate industry provides services to organizations is very driven by space and by op the operation and the success of a built environment. The way that we are working right now and for the foreseeable future will continue to work is not always centered around a unified space. We're not all commuting into a workplace together anymore. And so therefore the workplace experience is really fractal. Like we've got the, core, we have our core spaces, we have um, co-working spaces and third spaces, we have our homes uh, and how do companies design for good experiences across all three and make sure that the culture and the brand that they want their employees to understand and enjoy and want to be a part of are understood across all realms. So it really has created a more complex problem. And we are, we as Purposeful Intent believe that we are positioned to help serve all three of those realms uh, in a way that traditional consulting and traditional service providers uh, might need a little bit more time to redirect toward. Okay. And, and I think it's probably a prime time to do this because as we were also saying earlier, when people want to try and understand how they should do things differently, they used yeah. to go to events, as you were saying earlier, the event is for the sponsors to just get in front of people and try and sell them something, right? Yeah. They, don't, they don't go, but people want to go to events to understand, not just to be sold to. So right. I, I think, and you're right, we're seeing it with our customers, the change in how people are using the workplace, but people need help right to understand exactly. it's it's not people aren't the experts like you are in workplace even though they might be the head of real estate they're not workplace experts and right. and the workplace has changed this it's the covid ha, the covid covid has forced, covid <laughs> the, has forced, the covid it's serious <laughs> has forced change right so yes. it's forced change people don't go into the office all the time as we've proven you can work from anywhere we always knew that but now people do work from anywhere but yeah when you go to the office, what should it look like? You know, right. how do you make, how do you make it a better place for people to work somewhere where people want to go? You know, people are refusing to go if the office was crap before, but they had to <laughs> right. go because they were made to. Now it's like, I don't have to go because you know, you can't make me anymore because I've proven I work from home, but right. how do I make, you know, I, if I go in, I want it to be a cool place to work. Not only just because I like the surroundings, but you know, the collaboration spaces and, and everything else that's, it really has had a big impact, right? So, right. but I think you, I think what you're doing, I think a lot of people will take up because people don't necessarily have all the answers, right? Yeah. Because they're very insular. They they know their own business well, right. but but they don't necessarily know what they can do to help their business. Yeah, and I think the way that you just said that is a good distinction of they know their business, uh, but there's still not a really strong understanding of individual or team behaviors that yeah. then serve the business. So yeah. there's a, like, we understand the company, we understand what the business is about and how to make that successful, but there's still a lot of blind spots around how do we actually enable our people to 
be successful and drive this business success while also making them happy. Like it doesn't have to be this zero sum of this is the only way. And so therefore you must suffer through it. And to your point, uh, COVID has really flipped everything on its head of, yeah, yeah con- tangentially, we knew that we could work remotely. And, you know, if every, you know, every other Friday during like warm weather, when we snuck out to a beach or something like that, <laughs> it was no harm, no foul. But, you know, mm-hmm. we've been in a two year badly executed work from home experience, uh, work, for, work from home experiment. Yeah. And, and I say badly because no one was set up successfully. Most companies have not had the structures to really create good norms around dispersed working, like asynchronous hours or anything like that. So even with a bad experiment, we're still learning that there are parts of this that are quite successful. So it's one, it's a blessing that even in bad circumstances, we've got, we've turned some lemons into lemonade, but there's still so much to be learned about the in the people dynamics of dispersed working and which you know which aspects need to be in a built environment and uh even before we start deciding or start trying to figure out what the space should look like we need to think about what activities are actually attracting people back so far what i i've been seeing and hearing are like a lot of social aspects are pe- bringing people back to the office like they just miss being around their teammates and yes. you know It'll be like a no meeting day where they just hang out and, you know, brainstorm or just genuinely like have like a long lunch with one another just to have that social capital. Because, uh, well, there are some studies, um, I forget where it originated, but it's the study around loose, uh, strong ties and weak ties and strong, the strong ties through the pandemic have all gotten way, way tighter than they were prior. So that's our family members, the friends that are in our immediate circle, things, people like that, and even like your closest of coworkers. Your weak ties, like, you know, for instance, for me, if I was inside an organization in like a workplace team, a loose tie would probably be someone, uh, someone on the HR team or someone on a, like a project design team people who I would need to call on every now and then, but wouldn't be the person that I'm spending my days with, those got weaker because, you know, we weren't with one another. And those, so we need to figure out those new uh, levers to play with to make sure that the, the weak ties are not as weak as they currently are. And a lot of that comes through social interaction, has very little to do with the actual tactical work that people are doing. So, companies are now being confronted with, it's not just about the built, the design of the environment. It's not just like, how cool does it look? Or, you know, do I have snacks and plants? And I'm describing a WeWork because I am a WeWork alumni. And, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it needs to be more than just that. And, you know, the, the what is more than just that is how is the company creating experiences that people want to opt into? Or even if they're mandatory, like, a monthly town hall where everyone comes into the office and it's a no meeting day for the rest of the day. And you just get to mill around and be near your people. Like that, that could be an answer to strengthening those weak ties because you get to see that, see those people who are one or two orbits out of your immediate life. You get to bump into them and see them and catch up over coffee and things like that. So companies are now getting confronted with, we need to create experience programs and we need to create uh, genuine reasons for people to come back beyond just, all right, we're a hybrid company and you're going to be in three days of the week and at home too, because that's no, like, that's not a sufficient enough answer because to your point, we've all figured out majority, a good deal of what we do. And I'll put the asterisks of that this is very centered around knowledge workers, folks who are more technical, like engineering and coding, even like design architecture. Like there are pieces of the working world that do require more uh, more in-person work simply just because we haven't yet figured out the tech adaptation to make it seamless regardless of where you are. Um, Knowledge workers can do a, a, the lion's share of what they do wherever. Um, and so I, I've been making this joke of like, we're sort of, employees are sort of in this adolescent or teenager relationship with their organization. Like organization is saying, this is the rule. And we're like, why? We don't care. <laughs> so there's this like rebelliousness in this um, 
this challenging that's happening that companies who are paying attention and understanding that this isn't just a fad, um, they're taking it seriously and saying, okay, fair, we want them to still do this certain thing. So how do we articulate that it's worth it to them? Or how do we renegotiate what we believe is the standard to meet them closer to where they are? And those are the companies that I think are, one, those are the companies that are not going to lose employees as, you know, as people continue to shuffle around and find organizations that are more aligned to the flexibility or just like the life that they want to lead. Um, and they're also probably going to see far fewer business interruptions. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot that's on, a lot on the playing field to play with. <laughs> there is a hell of a lot, but something you said in there and, and, this is a genuine question for myself yeah. and hopefully other people want to know this as well. How much of the work that you are doing and the changes that you're making, you said something a little bit earlier, mm. a lot of it, some of it can just be people coming into the office and having a day with colleagues. Yeah. How much of the work that you do or the advice and the changes that are made in companies, how much of it is behavioral more than physical changes, right? Because everyone wants a nicer office. Everyone yeah. wants a cooler office with lots of cool stuff in it, but how much of the new way of working, how much of it is it, do you think it is behavioral, uh, behavioral over physical changes? Right now, I would say the majority is behavioral based purely because any data, so like if anyone listening is a head of real estate or in a corporate real estate team knows that they've got a ton of workplace data through sensors and other sort of like, you know, daily active user products and things like that. Almost everything that we currently have is no longer relevant. Anything from anything from January of 2020 and earlier makes zero sense for where we are today. And even the data that we might might have been collecting between January of 2020 and now isn't consistent enough to tell a, a, a realistic story about what we should be building and why. Because we've had too many fits and starts of coming back to reality because of the pandemic. Um, you know, latest being Omicron through the holiday season. Um, we don't have enough persistent data to tell a story. Um, I believe that that story will start when mask mandates are down and we are able to, for at least a period of six months, be able to go back to the office and behave normally. So yeah. maybe not go back to the office, cross that out, just behave normally. Yeah. whatever our new normal, yeah. whatever we're defining our new normal as. Yes. So that like, we have yet to reach the, the point where our data can tell us what a new baseline looks like. Okay. And so therefore it's too, like, there are a lot of companies who are sort of stymied and need to make design decisions. And so they're doing, you know, they're doing a lot of modular design and things that can be iterated, uh, as quickly and as like cheaply as possible because they just have to do something. But most, uh, most of what people are asking for is how are people going to behave? Because we need to understand those patterns first before yes. we start to consider what is going to be erected in the physical realm. Okay. That makes sense. And so uh, from a, a, a company perspective, when you're going in and, and helping businesses, I imagine you work with, different areas of the business to understand mm -hmm. how they want to work. But have, have you seen IT help companies create inclusive and innovative ways to help company culture? I mean, as, uh, reading a part of your bio is, is you, you, you kind of go in deep and wide into companies, right? You don't just do the traditional workplace and look at a redesign, you know, right. you, you're looking at estate, you're looking at IT, you're looking at comms, you know, or communications, you're looking yep. at lots of different areas. How, yes. How much, how much, does IT help now? How much does IT need to get involved with this as well? Uh, IT needs to get very involved. Um, I think in terms, I think it varies organization by organization and honestly, even leader by leader, which is from my perspective, a little, it's too, it's more risky than I would, than I would care for. But yeah. the way, so in the before times, Workplace was something that was almost exclusively owned by the real estate team. And that included employee experience, engagement, all the programming and stuff like that. Folks like, like groups like IT and comms and HR would be pulled in when needed, but they weren't, um, they weren't included enough 
And also, I don't think that they were, and I'm, these are broad generalizations, uh, I don't think that there was enough sort of incentive for them to understand just how crucial the workplace and the experience was to their business line. So <clears throat> they're, they're, getting, they're getting used to it. They're getting, they're getting more into it than they were previously, but there's still a problem, I believe, of them being an equal sh- stakeholder in the, in the workplace and it, again, digital or physical workplace. Um, and this is actually something that I've been teasing out with um, this uh, advisory philosophy that I'm building called effectiveness as a service. So basically what the approach I'm trying to take is to help organizations recognize that they are designing an experience for their employees. And there are just like any other product team would think about the different work streams that contribute. IT is a contributor, HR and policies and it, like employee benefits, the way that information is communicated. So comms and change management, things like that. All of that fills into an employee experience pretty equally to what the built environment is. It's just because the built environment is the tangible thing that we can poke and touch. People think it has an outsized uh, role in in the experience. So I say all of this to say a lot of IT and like tech leaders are starting to get smarter around where they can influence and why they should influence. But I think that there's a lot of change management to be done with those stakeholders to say, hey, you guys are actually a product team. You're not, you, you know, you don't just roll up to the CTO or the CIO and you don't just roll up to this like CHRO and the CFO. You guys are, you guys technically roll up to the employees. Like yeah. you're, the employees are your customer. Yeah. And also now I think because IT, it's whether it's Teams or Google Hangouts or Zoom or whatever it is, IT are involved now more than ever exactly. before. Right? It wasn't just, you know, even if it was just AV or IT, when it was video conferencing in a meeting room, otherwise outside of that, it was a telephone. But now right. because of Teams, because of Zoom, because of whatever, you know, the, the you know, more competition coming out, neat rooms and things mm-hmm. like that, IT needs to be part of this, right? Because exactly. The communications layer is not just the face-to-face anymore physically. It's exactly like you and I are now. So that's exactly it. And you know, there's more, there's more to measure in terms of the success of these digital tools. Like does this digital tool help you and I do what we need to do and do it effectively without like many hiccups or bugs or whatever, because we don't have an option of, getting, getting in touch in person with yeah. the same amount of ease. So, you know, there are, I think there are stronger measurements of success that are going to be tied, if not already to a tech team of like, you know, uh, this is, I'm using this purely as example, but like, you know, if you were to ask your employees, okay, it, we're going to be selecting between Slack and teams, you know, are you going to like, Price aside, experience, which one do you like more and why? Obviously, like anyone who's used both knows that there's a ton more functionality on a Slack than there is on a Teams. But does it, is the experience in terms of conferencing and messaging, is, it that, is there that much of a difference? Um, those are things that they need to be looking at from an experiential side, not just from a cost and uh, like information security side. So there are, there are new qualifiers that they need to be paying attention to. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to see more organizations coalesce in the way that I'm describing of like all these different employee, employee facing work streams are organizing themselves either as like a center of excellence. Some actually are reorganizing into like an experience organization. Um, in a way that I haven't seen previously, which is pretty exciting Um, because then it's starting to orient the organization around a customer base and not just the one that's buying their product out on the market. Yeah, and I, what what I thought may happen, but this may may not have happened because people are dispersed, but doing more joined up projects rather than siloed projects, I thought would would have, would be one of the outcomes of, of COVID because you know, now more than ever, you want to be able to speak to your teams to understand what you're doing because you're not always in the same place, but there's still some siloed 
you know, yeah. thinking and actions going on. But I gather if from, from the exactly why you started Purposeful Intent is to try and not break down the barriers is probably the wrong word, but bring everyone together to, yeah. to make to make the decision together. Because if you make it in isolation, that IT is not involved because they're just the tech guys. But actually, previously, that probably would have been a thing. But now 100%. Your, your ideas of bringing everyone together to be on the same page to start with, because different people have different requirements like finance work from home is different to it and tech work from home right absolutely and hr work from home so it's you know hr still need to have private conversations finance still need to have be you know looking at you know p and l's and you right. know, risk statements and things like that but mm -hmm. how you do that at home is completely different to throwing it if i'm doing my p and l's and, and looking at stuff i'd rather have it on a massive screen than my tiny laptop at home trying That's to run exactly. through it but right. also, if I'm doing it at work, where do I want to be doing it? So, yeah, there's a lot more inclusivity, I think, is is one of the one and of the. That, and that's exactly right. And I, that's certainly like a core part of like my working philosophy is it needs to be more inclusive and not just. Not inclusive in like the only in the warm and fuzzy kind of way. It's inclusive. Yeah. It's an inclusivity from a business risk perspective, like. Yeah. It, you should like companies should be incentivized or should see the incentive to having as much integration as possible because it saves you on uh, du like duplicate of like work efforts, like, yeah. you know, all uh, duplicate work efforts, people not knowing that there was something that happened in it, like historically that they're now trying to solve for all of that comes down to, in my mind, and this is unfortunately not my realm, but I can at least champion for how important it is, um, is digital transformation. And that's something that a lot of organizations, while they might have migrated all of their information to a cloud base or some sort of like network a network operation, uh, it still doesn't hit at how does the information then get, uh, how is the information then accessed by your people? Yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, years ago at an old job, like we used to joke and, you know, if we were looking for examples from previous client work and things like that, we called it dumpster diving. So <laughs> there was no rhyme or reason. And it was really just like, maybe, you, maybe you struck gold and found something in this random folder, but, yeah. you know, not having that clear uh, sort of like rubric of this is how we organize our information. This is where you can find stuff like this. And yeah. it, because it, it it was still, although it was digital, it was still reliant on oral tradition in a way of like, you needed to know the right person to ask to get the right thing. And uh, that's, that's hard. One, that's hard to ask for because, especially because we're dispersed, that, you know, one, two, three degree away connection is harder to make. And two, People are, people are shuffling right now. People are, you know, uh, company knowledge is leaving with people when they go to a new job and when they leave organizations. And if that's not captured anywhere, it's, it's then gone. So there's this second, second and third layer of digital transformation that I think needs to come next. Um, I don't know who those folks are who make that happen, but to me, I think that's the crucial next step to this because we have a lot of digital stuff, but we still operate in a very oral manner or in sort of like uh, untraceable manner in a way. So uh, it presents a really cool problem. I am excited to see how that you know gets improved and evolved over time. Um, but I think that that's really the the, ax the axle in the wheel for all of this. Until that happens we're still going to sort of be stuck where we are. Yeah. And so one of the other questions in here, and everyone, we, we touched on this earlier, but everyone's talking about hybrid working post-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your eyes, what, what is, and we've touched on this briefly, but what do you think is the most, I said, we've talked about lots of different parts, but what yeah. do you think is the most important part to make, you know, make a workplace successful forget hybrid workings we're all yeah. doing it yeah what do you think the most important part is is there is there one over another or, or is it a, is it cumulative is there one kind of golden piece that 
makes all the other bits come together or or, or not. Hmm. In the so in the in the built environment or just more broadly yeah. as like the concept. No, so in the no, built in-, in the okay. built environment because this is yeah, I think the built environment because you know working from home you set your own office up unless a company comes and says we're going to supply you with yeah. a chair, you know, an ergonomic chair, a desk and a lamp and a big screen. Yeah. Some companies are doing that and some people benefit from that. Some people just got to get on with it because they work for smaller companies. Fair. But this is back to the office, right? Is there yeah. one golden piece that, that, that of information that's the most important? Um, I would say the one golden piece would be sort of the, the mindset of how te- how companies design their workplace in general, which would just be don't design for permanence. Like yeah. design for things that can be fixed and, you know, tweaked and, you know, iterated upon because like I was saying earlier, we don't have a baseline for our future. And so yeah. what might be true for the rest of this year might not be true for 2023, 2024, 2025. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a hunch that, the, the workplace, and, you know, this has been discussed, I'll say, pretty broadly uh, in, in my little universe. So, you know, relatively speaking, it might not be, <laughs> it might be like a little drop in the bucket. But I think the trend will be people will come back to the office for those social aspects or for like big meetings or like big workshops, like interactive experiences are the things that will draw people back to the office. Um, and so with that, if that's the sort of core philosophy to work with, yeah, that means you're designing social spaces. So lounges, which are pricey because, you know, lounge furniture costs more than like linear benching and things like that, but it's also movable and it's also changeable. Um, I would say like, you know, those lounges and workshop spaces are probably going to be the most critical things to design for. Um, but again, that's just based on what we know now. So it it actually comes quite well onto the next question, which we had was, uh, so I know you just said before, we don't have enough data yet. So this might be a tricky one to answer, but how (laughs) how do you see the priorities of the workspace changing over the next 10 years? So based on what you just said, flexibility, obviously is probably one of the key ones, right? Mm -hmm. What, what, what else, what else do you think? What else do you, for the people who are in workplace, the head of workplace, head of real estate, or in a position where they're just trying to figure out how they make the workplace better for people to come back to for their three days a week. What, what yeah. do you think, how do you think is going to change over the next 10 years? Um, I do, I do think that we're going to see a bigger trend toward or a continued trend toward individual work is done away from the office. So whether it's at home or it's a third place or whatever, that I have a hunch that that's probably going to continue to be something that's done closer to home. Um, and the group stuff is where is what will happen in uh, a corporate environment or just an office environment. Um, and that can, ver- I mean, it can vary on a couple of different levels. It can vary in terms of how much square footage and a company keeps because you don't, you know, to design meeting rooms and lounges is not the same sort of square footage demand as I have a thousand employees and I need to build a thousand desks for them. And by and large, that's at a a rate of 150 square feet per person at at the minimum. Um, It's gonna be more cost effective, but we're also seeing a lot of companies keep their square footage and just, you know, rejigger the the box and play around with what what happens inside um so there's a a space trend that's happening and then in terms of like what the the design of the space is going to be in general i would say is um that's going to be more collaborative and and more group focused but you're still going to need to support individual activities and i say that because like you know, you could have a, a four hour workshop at the beginning of the day, but you're still going to have personal calls later in the day, or you might need to do some heads down work. You're going to need an environment that supports that. And so is it a, like a library or like a study space that your, your company is providing? 
how many phone booths are people are your company is your company providing um i would say if you you know if you are a head of real estate or a head of workplace that's listening you probably need to over index on the number of phone booths that you have in your environment by at least one and a half um because yeah. think of every single conversation is on zoom even if we're all in the same environment because we're we haven't yet figured out the equity of if i'm a re remote person dialing into a room do i have the same audio and meeting experience that those in the uh, in the room do too yeah. by and large it doesn't exist and so therefore there are a lot of companies um that are actually starting to do away with av in meeting rooms and everyone is like operating from their from their laptops so they might be like muted and things like that yes. but yeah, yeah, yeah. um that's been that's been at least for now proving to be a more equitable experience interesting so yeah. you know there's a lot of really weird quirky things that right now are acting like the band-aids and the glue yeah and aren't a total solution but it's the bridge that will get us to again once we have that better baseline then we can start investing more serious dollars into solving bigger problems and yeah, I, on that journey, kind of the next, forget 10, 10 years is quite a way, yeah. right? Even, even the work you're doing with, with, with customers now, how much of that work, so a lot around experience, a lot around team collaboration within the customer, how much mm -hmm. does data play? So, so from a prop tech perspective, so sensors, whether yeah. they're overhead, under desk, people count sensors, how, how much of that forms part of the work that you do? I, it's, it, it, in my mind, it's sort of like the left brain to the right brain. So the right brain for me is the, the, uh, the qualitative it's hearing from the people and the sentiment and, you know, just understanding the storytelling of like, I'm coming into the office for X, Y, and Z reasons. And then on the more analytical and quant side is the, the prop tech side of this and the data side of this. Um, I think one problem that, the prop tech world faces that it hasn't yet really teased out yet is they present a ton of data, like a behemoth of data to their customers. But the problem is their customers are not data scientists. And so there is a huge yeah. gap between the data that comes from these platforms that is really intelligent and can be really, really powerful if in the right hands. Um, but by and large, most real estate teams don't have a data scientist to really yeah. parse through that and say, hey, okay, so this is what this means. And it, it draws a parallel to the qualitative data that you have. So that's that's a gap that still needs to be solved for. And I'm, I'm working with and advising a couple of prop tech companies on like, you need to figure out your insights because you need to figure out how to deliver insights, not just data. Well, that's why purposeful intent exists, right? Because we yeah. are, we're, we're a software platform. We integrate lots of different sensors, but we are not workplace experts. You right. know, as you've said, we can provide a load of data to you that can right. help the customer, but. And, and old... even me personally, like I know enough to be dangerous, but I'm not a data scientist. Yeah. I would still, I would still need to call someone who I trust, who is way better on the quant side than I am to make sure that how I'm reading it is accurate. And so but, that's so a, we... that's a delivery gap. Is, is there, there's almost been in, in the new world, uh, yeah. we'll call it, there's almost the, you need a, you need the prop tech, you need the data, you need a company and a person like you in purposeful intent, and you need some data scientists, maybe someone yes. like an Accenture or an Avenard to say, yep. right, Mr. Customer, as well as you getting together on the inside, we need to get together on the outside to provide you with the data that you need. You know, Corinne and her team, are helping you understand the design, but to understand the design, they need this data and it comes from this platform and this data scientist is going to make the correlation between the two and then it all gets joined up. Is that yeah. kind of... I, I, I think that's the right kind of landscape. Um, yeah. I'm certain with the companies, the project companies I've been working with, I've been pushing them to think of like, what are the sort of basic insights that they can provide? Uh, just as a way to say, you know, we can't give you all, we can't give all the whole, you yeah. know, we can't give you the house for free, but we can give you some, we can give you some directional guidance from a quant basis for yeah. you to then work with. 
if you want to do dig deeper than either we have our own consulting arm or we partner with an Accenture or so on and so forth to really, really dig into the meat of this um, and help you move forward. Um, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity from a data perspective of not just the collection and the pr presentation of data, but it's the articulation of data. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, Agreed. that's a gap Agreed. that we yeah. still need help with. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think it's, I think it's only going to get bigger and bigger. Yeah. The more people start to understand how they're really using their real estate, because a lot of people, even that we know with what we do, a lot of people are realizing they don't actually need as much real estate as they thought. Right. No. So we were, and, and there's we were also just like a black that, box that we were buildings that were at 50, 60% usage. Ah, it doesn't matter. We've got plenty of money, but now actually it's like, hang on a minute. Do we, Really? Yeah. It, well, it is. Uh, yeah, we have a plenty of money, but is this is this where it's really best spent? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you know, um, given that, I, I mean, there's just so much like sort of like the philosophy of work stuff that centers around this of like the second that we as workers were given laptops was game over, and that was you know 20 years ago. That was before yeah. I was working, but yeah. like you know the introduction of laptops and the introduction of Wi-Fi was the sort of like the big bang for what we're experiencing now. Well, working started back then, right? I, I'm very old, so I'm much older than you. <laughs> I, when, I was, when I was given a laptop, it was dial up modem and that was still cool. I didn't have to go to the office. I could actually yeah. dial in and do some work, albeit right. very slowly, but it was, it was a cool thing to do. Right? <laughs> right, exactly. But so that was really, that was the first, that was the first step in this very long journey of, divorcing work from space. And that's still what we are trying to sort out. And it's not a devaluation of space. It now shows that space is a tool for work right. as opposed to the be all and end all of where it happens. Yeah, and it's the only place you can go to the office is to do work. That's kind of dead and buried, right? And Correct. There are some, there are some people who still think that, by the way. Right, but, you know. <laughs> it's in its death rattle. There are people who are still really, really trying. Yeah. And we'll see, we'll see what their attrition rates look like in about a year, but. Yes. yes. <laughs> I actually, I, I, I'm doing a lot of reading on this, given who we are and what we do as a business. And there are some companies just basically saying you are coming back five days a week. I think people will put up with that for a bit, but then they'll be looking at the job ads every day to get mm -hmm. out as soon as they humanly can. So mm -hmm. I, I can't believe people are still thinking like that, but then again, people are people. So I can believe people. Are still <laughs> right. Exactly. Humanity is humanity. <laughs> uh, you know, there can be a long tail of change, but yeah, you know, I think there's, I mean, I, I do want to, I, I want to give grace for, there are a lot of dependencies to this. There's a, this is not a, this isn't a complicated problem. This is a complex problem. So complicated means that it's just naughty and messy, but eventually would get ironed out complex is there's just always going to be layers and layers of nuance to this. And, you know, there are certain industries and even certain kinds of cities that uh, are predisposed to, we should just keep it as is because there's too much risk. And like, if we pull this part of the pin of the grenade, it creates X, Y, and Z risk. So will that always be? I, I doubt it but we are still in the early adoption phase of flexible work, dispersed workplaces and, and like hybrid workplace experiences. So um, I do want to at least be patient with those, but you know, they are, a lot of them are huge multinational organizations that do set example and, you know, being a champion for what I'm a champion of, it is frustrating to see, but I do agree with you. Like, People, I think certain people will put up with it because of a very various set of things. Maybe they are close to retirement and they're just going to hang on until until that's the time, or you know this is the right job for them for you know whatever kind of reason. Maybe that maybe there was a you know loans were taken care of, or you know there's the right kind of childcare. Who you know we can there are a million different instances that could justify or back up why someone would stay in a setting like that. But those are conditional at the end of the day, it's conditional. Yeah. Um, and how long to your point, how long those conditions last uh, is really up for grabs. Um, because I do think that 
you know, the I think the key questions or like the key concerns that are bubbling up now with dispersed work and flexible work is, you know, the loss of mentorship and that social aspect. Yes. Yeah. That's one. And I think another is, um, I oh, just lost my train of thought, but on that one, like on mentorship and the social aspect, we just haven't figured out the way to reroute that experience and also yeah. like take a good, honest look at it because there's, you know, this sort of, uh, sort of like the, the lofty, oh, well, you know, mentorship happened in the office. Sometimes, like I've been in plenty of offices where, you know, even though I was young and I wanted that mentorship, I didn't find it or I didn't find the right person. So it's a, in some ways there's like this, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps attitude towards it. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah. well, depending on what your office culture is like, there are a number of people who might not, not have ever had access to that kind of mentorship that you are proud of. Yeah. So there's not a lot of equity or, or like inclusion around that kind of activity. So this is a challenge for people like me to design uh, people like me and people who are, you know, far more, far, far more expert in DEI than I am to design mentorship programs that are inclusive and are equitable um, rather than just saying, Oh, well, you know, mentorship happens in the office like sort of just writing it off as like, yeah, yeah. that's the black box where that stuff happens. Um, and I, and innovation is the other one that I was thinking. Um, we're in a moment where w innovation might be taking a hit and we just don't have enough data to really prove it yet. And I, de I define innovation by like the generation and the shipping of new ideas. Yeah. We genuinely might be in a lull with that right now. But again, there are other, other, you know, worldly circumstances that could be influencing that, like a two-year global pandemic, like a war in Eastern Europe. Like, you know, there are a lot of things that, you know, affect our psyche that then also affect our capacity to do what we do at the greatest potential. Yeah. I also believe that there are people out there who are figuring out what are the tools or what are the mechanisms, what are the methods that are needed to promote greater uh distributed or like hybrid innovation like yeah, I, if a global company I, I can figure it out yeah naturally it, like pre-pandemic we're on our way but like these are things that to be more intentional about and more specific about than we were pre-pandemic yeah and, and innovation is, is an interesting one because innovation just doesn't happen when you all go into a room and you spontaneously right i know when you would at home <laughs> so you can have a great you can have a great idea at home, part of it, and then you bring it into a room with a team and then all of you together actually make it better or change it and evolve it and things like exactly. that. Exactly. Right. As, as, as though as though a particular meeting room had the monopoly on innovation. <laughs> yes, exactly right. I've got a whiteboard right over here near my bed, but, you know, sure, innovation doesn't happen here in my apartment. Yeah. <laughs> Only in the office in meeting room. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> everywhere else, I don't know what to define it. Sorry. There's no innovation everywhere else. Uh, Corinne, uh, just before we finish, we always do a quick, quick fire round of questions. So I'm sure. going to throw some questions at you uh, before I say thank you very much for being on. So what was your first ever job? My first ever job was at a concession stand in my hometown, and I served hot dogs and pretzels. And where, where is your hometown? Uh, West Babylon, New York, on Long Island. Okay, cool. Uh, where, and this is ba basically on what we've just finished on, this is quite a good question. When and where do you feel the most productive? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Cause I mean, I, I'll, I'll go quickly on it. I would say I feel most productive when I'm facilitating conversations for people, when I'm the one that's like playing quartermaster. Yeah. Okay. What's your favorite book? Um, Ooh, Meet Me in the Bathroom. It's a oral history of music in New York City from like the late 90s to 2000. So like LCD Sound System, Hot Chip, um, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah's, Interpol. So oh, super cool. cool. Yeah. I will, uh, I'll tell our head of technology he would, I think he would like that. What's it <laughs> it's, it's awesome. What's it, what's it called? Meet, meet Me in the Bathroom. Meet Me in the Bathroom. Uh, meet Me in the Bathroom. I will, I will write that down so I can tell Sam. It's uh, a good one. When you're not working, how do you spend your time? Maybe listening to music, but what else? Uh, definitely listening to music, cooking, uh, and you know, my friends and I are big foodies, so spending a lot of time, well, actually, 
cross that out. I hate the word foodie. I never said that. We love, <laughs> we love food and we love cooking it and eating it. So, you know, we are very spoiled by being in New York City and, you know, having the it's embarrassment. Like London, London, London yeah. we're very spoiled as well. When I first moved here, it sucked. But over the years, it's got yeah. much better. I mean, I, yeah, going to Shoreditch, like I, the food scene in Shoreditch is especially like I love. So like, you know, it's just, you get spoiled by delicious things. So we, we were in Shoreditch last night for our Chris March party. It was supposed to be Christmas, but we were supposed to have it in March. <laughs> and ended up in April. I like that. Chris March. <laughs> so uh, so hi, this is an easy one. Hybrid working, hybrid working. Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and the last one, knowing what you know now, what would, what advice would you give your younger self? Hmm. Believe that it's going to work out, but keep working hard. Very cool. Very cool. Corinne, thank you very much for being my on. My pleasure. It's, thank it's, you so much. This is great. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. If if there was some groaning, it wasn't me. It is my dog who's been here the whole time. So if you heard some strange noises, it wasn't me, honestly. It wasn't. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, <laughs> thank That's you acceptable. Much. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and you take care and, and everybody listening and watching, thanks very much. Uh, we'll see you for the next PropTech Ramble. I don't know what it is because it's not written down in front of me. And if it's not written down in front of me, I have no idea. But thank you, everybody. And Corinne, thanks very much again. Cheers. Thank you. Take care. Bye. That's it. We're good. Thank you awesome. very much. Corinne. So exciting. Thank you so much. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the fun.